Okay, I want to see if I can get some commentary out this morning. This is, um, I guess, the only uh, introduction necessary is this will be a completely um, unrelated or unstructured uh, collection of different topics. Um, not, well, none of the topics are um, fully uh, prepped or um, set up. <laughs> this is all ad lib. But uh, anyways, first topic has to do with, um, I think, I think the topic is artillery in uh, war games. So this is prompted by, um, I read, it's not the only time, this has happened numerous times, but uh, recently I was reading online um, a person's commentary and assessment review of a war game. And the commentary at one point went like this, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. Um, this game uh, has very deadly artillery. Okay, um, artillery is very lethal in this war game. That is good. Uh, therefore, I like this game. So, so basically, the idea is this war game. In this war game, artillery was very lethal, and so therefore that, in this person's mind, was a reason to, to like this war game, um, and to, I guess, favorably review this, this war game. And, well, to say the least, it has, uh, this is one of those comments where, uh, for no obvious reason, it, uh, yeah, for no obvious reason, it, um, sparked a chord, um, struck a chord in me. Um, and why would that be? So, artillery and war games. Before I even get to artillery and war games, I think, I just want to say, eh, we really need to st steer clear of such litmus tests for war games. And the reason why is just because war games are by their nature too complex to really uh, um, to really uh, be so, so summarily tested. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's the first Kind of big point. Um, let's ditch these litmus tests. Okay. Now, why why artillery in particular? Um, I've had, um, yeah. Again, in no way, in no proceeding, in no structured way here. <laughs> I've had this impression that uh, war game design. And when I say war game design, I, when I say war game design, that always, uh, or I should say so far, I've, I've realized that when I say war game design, I don't just mean the designers, I mean war game players, because I believe that there is a very real, there is a very real um, uh, relationship between designers and players. Um, basically, yes, designers are designing as individuals, but uh, designers are, it seems to me, incredibly um, influenced by player feedback. Um, so, so, players give a lot of feedback to designers, and designers work as designers um, in part in, in, in response to that player feedback. Okay, so so where would there be a player feedback even regarding artillery? And I wondered if uh, the, um, in, again, there might, might be better ways of putting this, but the thumbnail sketch sketches, the thumbnail sketches of artillery on the battlefield, I think have been horribly... Um, uh, 
warped by popular historical accounts of artillery during the First World War. Um, to put it bluntly, I think too many, um, too many people in general have a, or I should say, not people in general. Generally speaking, I think people have too much of a an impression of artillery that's colored by what is pretty obviously a very unique experience of 1914 to 1918. Um, and then war gamers, I think, are just just ramp this up a few levels um, with access to popular histories. Um, and then if you want to go up one or more levels from there, um, academic history, yes. Obviously, academic history has, has dealt with artillery lethality during the Great War, too. But, but I'm figuring a lot of war gamers stop at the popular history level. And so there is this feedback, basically, of popular historical accounts and even just simply impressions of artillery during the Great War um, influences war game players. War game players are through feed, the, you know, the feedback loop influencing designers. And so the end, the end result is artillery on the battlefield is too skewed towards the peculiarities of 1914 and 1918. Um, and why would this even matter to me? Okay. Uh, uh, I cannot stress enough how I'm just um, feeling my way forward here. Um, and I could take a huge misstep. No, no problem. I'm always happy to revisit issues. Um, so, artillery in, in war games. So, war games, again, by their nature, as a, as a war game, um, by definition, a war game has some uh, degree of simulation to it or in it. Um, I don't expect everybody to, I mean, I'm just dropping that out there. I, I do not expect everybody to uh, immediately agree with that. But um, I think by definition, a war game, by virtue of the connection to something real like war, means that that game has some degree of simulation in it. And simulations, um, a simulation is a, is a construct of various things, in, but in part a simulation is made up of different models. So basically artillery is modeled in a war game. I mean, if there's artillery in a war game, it's a model of artillery on the battlefield. Um, and, and so now we're down to the model of artillery in a war game and underneath every model is a theory, whether that theory is explicit, whether that theory is even accurate, whether that theory is even internally consistent underneath the model is a theory. So when a designer puts artillery in a war game, there is an underlying theory um, behind that model of, our, of artillery. So where would that theory come from? If you have a war game, let's say, um, designed uh, for a period that has extensive historical records, designed by, let's even say, a designer who served in the military as an artillery officer, um, a battery commander, an artillery battalion commander. Um, that designer could easily, um, the theory going into that model of artillery in the war game, could be very um, closely aligned with um, the theories that make up artillery doctrine, for, for example, 
doesn't have to be that. I'm just, I'm just giving one example of where the theory might come from that's underneath the model of artillery in, a, in the simulation part of a war game. Um, or, the, or the theory could come from, you know, on the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, the theory could come from a handful of Hollywood war movies. Maybe. Um, and I guess there are tons of different, you know, examples in between those two extremes. Um, so again, what, why does this matter to me? Um, if you, if you, I guess if you accept that war games have a simulation component, simulations, the simulation component is made up of one or more models and underneath models are theories and theories can come from either they, the theories can come from the real world or the theories can come from pure fantasy or it, well, yeah, I mean, pure fantasy is, is, is an okay way to put it, but the theory could come from uh, an abstract theory, I guess. It could come from, um, I guess, a made-up theory. A made-up theory is still a theory, but a made-up theory would be different than a real-world theory. Um, and I'm not saying there couldn't be deep you know, connection, overlap between those two, but basically... Real-world theories versus uh, made-up theories of one sort or another. So, if you accept all of that, when you are playing a war game, which is kind of my first point, when you are playing a war game, whether you realize it or not, you are teaching yourself something through the underlying theories. Now, don't get me wrong. This is not some type of... You know, this, isn't, this isn't... I am not referring to anything subliminal. I'm not referring to anything nefarious. Um, uh, it's perfectly possible to play a war game and to more or less see the underlying theories and not accept them, but you can still play the, the game. You can still, uh, yeah, you can still play the war game, enjoy the war game. And you, and you can see the underlying theories and you can, well, essentially reject the underlying theories but, um, but that, but I'm saying that that is also a process of learning. So whether it's, whether it's, um, obvious or not, whether it's realized or not, um, you're playing a war game. Again, if there's this link between simulation to underlying theories, then you're teaching yourself something about the subject matter and the subject matter is primarily war. And then from there, it's whatever, whatever historical period, you know, context, etc. But you're teaching yourself something. So does it matter? Uh, so does it matter what you're teaching yourself? And it doesn't automatic, it does not automatically matter. It depends. It depends on if it matters. And for some, it matters more for others, less. Um, there are various ways of looking at that. Um, but, but, Back to the idea that a good war game is defined by modeling artillery as especially lethal. So no doubt I've uh, <clears throat> wrestled in my own mind with how to um, kind of get to the, the heart of this whole issue. Um, so I think I have that and I'll just lay that out now and then go on to some related things. Why this matters to me is that the blanket and kind of un, un, um, unexamined assumption that artillery is the big killer on the battlefield goes, well, flies in the face of, goes directly against the um, the uh, against the uh, I don't know I don't know how to put it but it flies in the face of what I um, um, communicated to my soldiers um, and I guess I have to leave it that way because this is not like in any official sense okay but 
unofficially as a, um, especially as a platoon leader in Iraq, secondarily as a company commander in Afghanistan, but definitely as a platoon leader in Iraq, 2004. Um, again, how I communicated with my soldiers about how, well, basically how to survive on the battlefield, right? And in, in communicating how to survive on the battlefield, you're naturally, you have to talk about threats and you have to talk about risk and you have to talk about, you know, probabilities, right? Um, so, so again, I'm going to try to put a, a fine point on this. Uh, even though in, in Iraq, as a platoon leader, I was actually a Bradley platoon leader at that point. Okay, so um, I'm sorry, I was a Bradley platoon leader before deploying. Uh, when I deployed to Iraq, I was a support platoon leader with with trucks and, and um, Humvees, and later up-armored Humvees. Um, so our vehicles were mounted with 50 cals, Mark 19s, um, 240 Bravos. Okay, uh, so basically... It's the first infantry division. It's a mechanized infantry battalion. So this is mechanized infantry. Um, so even though at that time I was with the first infantry division, mechanized infantry, my upbringing was really in the light infantry with the 101st. So in my upbringing as an infantryman, I learned from my mentors, do not fear artillery on the battlefield. Okay, Do not fear artillery on the battlefield. And that's what I you know, in turn, uh, communicated to, you know, the generation of soldiers that I was, um, privileged enough to influence. So to see war games boil this all down to, so, so now let me talk about this war game treatment of artillery. If artillery is treated as the, as the big powerful, uh, asset, um, with a with a high degree of lethality, it it produces some. It warps some thinking. It produces some odd ideas, um, impressions. So, if we're talking a simple hex encounter war game. Got my infantry, got my armor, got my artillery. And if artillery is the big killer, then, and especially at range, then the, the, uh, kind of the corollary of that is that I should use my infantry and my armor to defend, essentially defend my artillery so the artillery can survive to obliterate, quote unquote, the enemy. Which of course is a complete warping of, of combined arms, uh, and and it's, see it's more obvious when I distill it that way, and and that's why um, artillery cannot be so um, simplistically uh, modeled. Um, Okay, so I know I run the risk of um, falsely implying, or not falsely, incorrectly implying that so many war games so overblow the uh, the uh, strength or lethality of, of artillery. And that's not what I'm trying to say, and then uh, that wouldn't be very defensible. But... Still, there are games where, again, they they still warp the role of artillery, which warps ideas of combat of combined arms, which warps the the, the underlying theory of combat. Um, for example, when gamers think again, when when gamers have this expectation that artillery should be so lethal, because after all, didn't artillery pound the Western Front during the First World War into, you know, fine sand and dust and mud? Um, when, so, 
seems that it creates this expectation. And I'm thinking of a particular game where when you fire with your offboard artillery, I mean, you're pretty much guaranteed to cause, you're pretty much guaranteed to cause some casualties and you may cause a lot of casualties. So again, especially if you have no ammo issues, you have no ammo shortage issues, then again, this, this creates an incentive to just blast away with your artillery because the odds are so uh, stacked that you're just going to whittle away the enemy at a pretty almost predictable rate turn to turn. Add to that the ridiculous... Uh, okay, now I'm, now I'm widening the aperture here uh, unintentionally, but... So, so let me flip this all around. So let me flip this all around. I've, I've not done a very good job. Um, yeah, I haven't done a good job implying that there's any real problem here at all, but I still believe there's a problem. <laughs> I just, just haven't communicated it well. Um, let me flip it all around. Let me flip it all around. So first of all, to, to get a much better uh, first impression of what artillery on the battlefield is really like. Just try to take a look at uh, um, SPI's old firefight game. Now, firefight game, for me, I I won't even play it out of the box. It has so many other issues. However, I frankly like its artillery modeling. And especially the different types of missions. And the different types of missions are actually, you know, uh, fundamentally different. Um, as a matter of fact, the artillery system in firefight, which is team, fire team scale, fire team slash crew scale, the artillery modeling in firefight is actually um, out of place in, even in a game of that scale and scope. That model could easily be applied all the way up to battalion scale and not be out of place. Um, and then, of course, look at uh, tactical combat series and see how our artillery is modeled there. Um, so here's the... Here's the... Here's the point, and here's why um, I was taught by my, you know, it was passed on to me from my mentors in the light infantry, you don't fear the artillery, um, and why that was carried over in modified form to um, my experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, artillery can be nearly useless in some circumstances, and it can be highly lethal in some circumstances. And it's basically separating these out that is incredibly important to properly modeling um, artillery on the battlefield. Now, I have to say up front, it, it, because it is critical, even though I this is a recurring uh, underlying point for me, scale and scope absolutely matters, absolutely matters. If you're talking about division and core on an entire front of even the First World War, having artillery lethality, you know, a, a high-profile component, a design component, can be perfectly fine. Um, or it can be, uh, it can be justified. Um, so scale and scope absolutely matter. And I'm mostly concerned with the lower levels where, where, well, basically where these different theories, so now we're talking about theories of infantry combat, theories of armored combat, th theories of indirect fire combat, where these can be meaningfully, um, differentiated and seen, <laughs> um, so I am talking about lo the lower tactical levels, um, and artillery, uh, 
And, and by the way, let's I mean, throw another thought experiment in here to try to make the try to make the reverse argument. Um, for example, artillery. Artillery was was seen to be was seen to be successful enough during the First World War that artillery proliferated across the different armies. Um, so, again, as a thought experiment, imagine a modern army where, let's just take that to the extreme. Let's basically organize our entire army into different kinds of artillery units, right? You have short range, direct fire guns, uh, all different types of mortars, howitzers, you know, uh, self-propelled artillery, but basically an army of artillery. <laughs> um, and we're talking about all, I mean, yeah, you might have light artillery, you may have airdroppable artillery all the way up to full, fully armored, fast, self-propelled artillery. But still, an army of artillery, an army that relies on indirect fire, basically. Um, this army would be, first. the first thing that would happen as this army became a reality is that an opponent would simply adapt. And an opponent would look at this army, analyze the underlying theory, call it theory of victory. I mean, it starts with a theory of victory at the very top. A country that did this would say, artillery is so lethal, and artillery can be so lethal at such ranges, and indirect fire is, you know, the stronger form of warfare, and so, therefore, this, this imaginary country, their theory of victory would be, we will win on the battlefield because we will destroy from a distance um, through indirect fire of all sorts. And the, the pure, and, and then underlying that, the lethality of units, of artillery units, is such that um, we can maximize our potential lethality with an army of artillery. And an opponent would analyze this and <laughs> find the, the, the weaknesses and adapt. And bottom line is, after an opponent has adapted, again, this is thought experiment, you put those, pit those two armies together on the battlefield, and I am, um, I am uh, proposing, you know, I'm, I'm, I am uh, speculating that that army of artillery would fire away day and night, pulverize the ground, um, just launch an almost incalculable amount of ordnance. And I'm saying, speculating, that they would accomplish absolutely nothing. <laughs> they would turn over the ground again and again and again. Um, the enemy would nowhere, would be nowhere to be found. Um, and through another theory of victory, the opposing army would take down such a, such an imbalanced army and by extension, an imbalanced theory of victory. Um, now this is not all speculation. This is not all speculation. Um, armies have gone down this road with tanks, N not nearly to the extreme. Of course, I'm, I made it extreme to make the point. But armies have gone down a road where they've relied too much on tanks. Um, armies have gone down a road where they have relied too much on basically uh, long-range indirect fires, missiles, which is really a, a slight step away from what I just talked about um, of an artillery dominated army. Um, so armies have gone down these, and, and there are many other examples where armies have gone down a road where they've allowed their 
again, starting with the theory of victory and go all the way down to doctrine, they've allowed their, their thinking on war to be, to be, uh, to, to become imbalanced and have, um, and expose major vulnerabilities, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not it's not entirely a uh, not entirely speculation what I'm talking about here. So so back to artillery and war games, and at the lower tactical levels that I'm thinking most of, um, basically artillery is hard to employ, um, and if it's easy to employ artillery in the war game, right there we got a problem. Um, um, so let me at least try to wrap up things that I started. <laughs> um, however, um, disjointed this may have all been. Um, so let me just try to wrap up at least what I started. Um, artillery as an arm has, has strengths and weaknesses. And if these are not modeled properly in a war game, we're facing some serious conceptual problems. Um, yeah. Um, artillery simply is hard to employ. Um, and that difficulty needs to come through in a war game. And that may not be what players are looking for. So I would hope that a war game, if I play a war game for the first time and it, and, and, and it's a good design and I accomplish nothing with my artillery, I want to, in that game, I want to play more, uh, pay closer attention, <laughs> practice more and figure out how to effectively use artillery in that game. And at the end of the day, I want that to at least be some type of um, analog to real-world artillery. Then I can say I'm learning something worthwhile. Um, okay, I talked about... Um, yeah, I talked about not fearing the the artillery. Well, has yeah, I talked about at least one other thing too. But um, uh, what what the idea of don't fear the artillery sounds like don't fear the reaper, right? Um, don't fear the artillery. Um, the idea behind that it's what I took in an underlying way for my mentors, it's what I passed on, is war is a thinking man's game. Combat is a thinking man's game. And that's what I definitely communicated directly to my soldiers. Combat is a thinking man's game. War is a thinking man's game. Don't fear the artillery really means figure out what you're facing. Um, be clear-eyed and sober and assess what you're facing. Figure out vulnerabilities and go after them. So figure out what you're facing and outsmart what you're facing. Um, the uh, the idea that artillery, uh, so the idea that artillery is always some type of, you know, I don't like this expression, but you know, the, the death ray uh, you know, the worst war game is where, again, scale and scope matters, but where artillery, if it, if artillery hits a unit in the open, it's like vaporized, which is ridiculous. Um, and if it, and if artillery hits a unit in a built up area, it does less damage, but still does a lot of damage. And if the artillery hits a unit in woods, for example, it does even less dam or it does it does less damage than in the open, but still does a lot of damage. This is this is just simplified to silliness. 
Um, it just doesn't, you know, for the scale and scope I'm talking about, I'm really talking about the battalion and below, or either battalion and below or below battalion scale. That just won't, will not work. It's too simplistic. Um, and so, and so then back to, um, yeah, and so I, back to what I was just getting at, the mentality. I said, thinking man's game. So it's a mentality. I always knew that what I was picking up from my mentors was a mentality, and what I was passing on was a mentality. The mentality that uh, that you need to you need to keep your mind together, and again, you need to figure out what you're facing and beat it. And to do that, you got to be smart. You can't be fearful. So, what does this mean in more in more practical terms? Um, so let's take artillery, um, as a platoon leader, um, and I think this builds off what I just said and it has to do with artillery. The weapon system is only as good as the human opponent you're facing. Um, kind of one off lucky shots. Of course they, they, Happen. Of course they happen, but that's not combat, that's not war, that's not that's not in the picture. So the kind of one-off lucky shot thing, discount that. Um, the enemy weapon system that you're facing is only as good as the as the enemy employing it. And the enemy as a network. Not, of course, when I say enemy, I don't mean just the individual or even a unit of a bunch of individuals, but we're talking about the network, right? The human network on the other side. So this matters in, in Iraq when I um, talk to my soldiers about dealing with IEDs. IED is a, is a weapon system. And emphasizing to my soldiers the mentality of, of, uh, of, uh, of overcoming this and you know I cannot I may be talking in a in a uh, I may be talking in a relaxed manner t- right now but uh, understand that this was 2004 IEDs were uh, exploding to use <laughs> use a bad pun um, and units were in, these are my words. Units across Iraq were seizing up. They were they were being paralyzed with fear of this, you know, quote unquote new system. Of course, it was not a new system, but there was, in my words, there was a certain amount of panic early on. Um, it was not expected. Uh, army units like me there with my unit units felt unprepared. Um, so on and so forth. So I cannot stress enough how uh, uh, cannot stress enough how it was a serious issue. However, me as a platoon leader dealing with my men with, in my battalion, in my brigade, in my division, it was still a mentality of of uh, you know we're going to defeat the IEDs by defeating the enemy. Um, and by the way, I should say that it, 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 perhaps, I don't know, maybe it helped my, maybe it helped my credibility that my vehicle got hit with an IED very early on, not very early on, but early on in the fighting season. Um, and, and when I showed my soldiers, my reaction to that, okay, an IED on my vehicle against my vehicle, um, the ability for me to show my soldiers how to react and how to handle that was, you know, you, you can't overstate the teaching moment, which is a ridiculous way. It's a ridiculous way to put it, but, but, um, 
I know it had a huge impact on my soldiers to see it. They, it was like, uh, no, literally, it was like a, uh, it was like opening a door. It was like releasing a huge amount of pressure. It was like, you know, it was like opening a pressurized chamber. Um, and it just let out all of this fear, panic, and, and so on and so forth. So anyways, this is what I mean when I get back to kind of the personal level of of uh, looking at war. Well, it, it, yeah, it does come down to treating war and looking at war as a, as a grossly simplified um, well, game. <laughs> um, and all the problems that that causes, you know, incorrect impressions leading to uh, incorrect assessments, leading to difficulty understanding history, um, that kind of cascading effect. So the counter is, so I've said that, now let me talk about the counter. The counter is really just be clear-eyed, be sober, look at what things really are, and assess them for what they really are. So when I was a company commander in Afghanistan, and I was planning op planning and leading operations um, for units going against, you know, an unknown enemy, quote unquote unknown enemy. I, I don't like that expression, but you know, a, uh, an insurgent enemy. Um, the ability to you know, to get your soldiers to do that includes the ability for you to convince them that you understand what you're facing and that you know how to overcome it. And to do that, you have to understand what you're really facing. So to back up again, when I was a platoon leader and I, and I passed on the mentality again, of don't fear the artillery. It was, look at what artillery really is. And it's not, it's not a, well, it's not a great obliterator. That's, that's a, that's a mental fear that you can, uh, that can seize up your, your thinking. All right, I'm running out of power, so I'm going to leave this um, topic for now.